Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That So Poe, and today I'm joined by my husband, Sush. Hello. And we are going to be doing a discussion video talking about all of the short stories that are finalists for the Hugo Awards this year. Um, if you're not familiar, I have an entire playlist, um, which I will link below, of the Hugo Awards that we've been focusing on. We have already done videos discussing the novelettes and the novellas that have been nominated, and soon we will also do one for the novels. The Hugo Awards are a world science fiction and fantasy award that are given out each year, and since we are supporting members in Worldcon, we get to vote in that. So we've been reading these uh, books in these categories, and today we're going to talk about the short stories. So these short stories are all available to read for free online, so I have links to all of that below if you're interested. Because these are short stories, um, if you want to go in completely unspoiled, you may want to read those before watching this simply because sometimes with a short story, even talking about the premise gives away a little bit much. What we're going to do here is just briefly talk about what the short stories are about and then delve a little bit into the themes and kind of what we thought of them. Okay, so we're going to talk about these short stories in order of kind of lowest ranked to highest ranked according to my ranking. Um, there are some differences in the way that Sush and I ranked these stories, but we'll both talk about kind of what we thought. So the first story that we want to talk about is Do Not Look Back, My Line by Alex E. Harrow. This story is set in sort of a barbarian, warrior-like world where um, basically everybody in power is a woman. So there are all of these women warriors. They are big and battle-scarred and they go out and there's lots of battles, lots of bloodlust, um, and they worship a, a goddess of war. Um, and in this world, these warrior women often have husbands who are other women who stay at home and you know take care of the family, these sorts of things. The ones who go to war are the wives. Um, there are men in this world as well, but they are very much on the sidelines. They um, don't do very much and maybe just support the women. So in this world, we follow one of the husbands, a woman who stays at home, and she is extremely unhappy with the society. She doesn't like all of the warring. She is a healer. She is somebody who um, has many children and she doesn't love that they are all sent to the war. She wants to be able to have peace and kind of care for them. Um, and this causes a lot of conflict with her and her wife. So this story is something that I had a lot of problems with. Like a lot, a lot of problems with, yeah. Sush um, is remembering me ranting about this story. Um, and before I talk about those problems, I want to just give a little bit of a preface and explain that um, I don't know how much of me having a problem with this story is the story and how much of it is just me um, having issues with Harrow as an author. So Alex E. Harrow is somebody who we read a short story of last year, which was A Witch's Guide to Escape. A practical compendium of portal fantasies and that is something that actually won the Hugo but that I had issues with because it had a lot of messaging about kind of white saviorism it was just very racially problematic I thought um, she also came out with a book this year that is also nominated for a Hugo called The 10,000 Doors of January which lots of people are loving but I've also heard some people say has um, also issues with the portrayal of race. So I went into this short story not really sure what was going to happen. Um, and I think that that could have made me a lot more sensitive to any of the themes that popped up. But I had a lot of issues with this. So if you are somebody who has read this short story, I would really, really love to hear what you think in the comments below. Um, either if you see the things that I saw or if you didn't see them, I'd just really like to hear that uh, because some of the issues that I had with this, nobody else talked about other than me and Sush and we read it together out loud to each other. So that's a little bit, again, of a bias. So first let me talk about what I think the surface level themes were. And then I'll talk about the underlying themes, which are the ones that I had an issue with. So on the surface, this story is a pacifist story. It's an anti-war story. It's a story about a woman who lives in a warrior society that's constantly battling at war and does not like that. 
Um, it also is on the surface like a feminist story because there are women. Women dominate the society. They are, there's a woman emperor. There are women battle heroes. There are women who stay at home and men are very much not um, a very important part of the society. So on the surface, that seems very feminist. However, I think that those are very much only surface level themes. And what I really got out of this story is a lot of the underlying themes are very insidious. I think that they have really um, kind of powerfully negative connotations and meanings. So the way that I read this story very much falls into the idea of feminazis. So this is a term that is kind of a, a used by some conservative pundits. Um, I think it was popularized by Rush Limbaugh. And I'm just going to read the definition of what this means from Wikipedia, and then I'm going to talk about why this story really had that messaging to me. So according to Wikipedia, this feminazi refers to radical feminists whose goal is to see that there are as many abortions as possible and they are a small group of militants uh, characterized as having a quest for power and a belief that men aren't necessary. Also, it is used to characterize feminist perspectives as extreme in order to discredit feminist arguments, portraying feminists as bossy and hating men and femininity. So, this is what a feminazi is kind of defined as. And even though this short story on the surface kind of seems feminist because there's all of these women in power, I actually think that it's anti-feminist because it's portraying sort of feminazis. Um, you have this contrast throughout the entire story between the warrior women and the main character, Aoife, who is this um, healer and pacifist and mother. And so at each stage of the story, we're seeing some of these ideas of feminazis play out where the warrior women are the feminazis and Aoife is the sort of kind of traditional homemaker. Um, so we have this idea of um, feminazis are very much, uh, they want power and war. And we see all of these, you know, women warriors and the emperor who are constantly battling always at war versus Aoife who's very much, you know, willing to take a stand and say, I, I don't want my children to go to war anymore. Um, we also have the idea of kind of feminazis being completely unfeminine. The warrior women are described as almost like Conan the Barbarian types. They're huge and hulking and muscular and maybe even fat and they have scars that they inflict upon themselves and they're just these big people. And then you have Aoife who is portrayed as a lot kind of smaller, more petite, more feminine. Um, and that contrast is just, it really falls into these lines. We also have this idea of feminazis being anti-male. And in this story, men are completely sidelined. They exist, but they're used mainly just for procreation. They're kind of like sex workers or they're servants. So one of Aoife's children is a son and he is simply a servant to one of the daughters um, in battle. That's all he does. He just helps clean the um, battle gear, these sorts of things. And then very importantly, um, there's this idea that feminazis do not value children's lives, that, you know, they're pro-abortion. Um, and this story has a lot of pro-life messaging, not just in that Aoife doesn't want her children to go to war, but also um, there's a lot in here about uh, fetuses. So in this story, her wife gets pregnant, um, but still goes to war, even though Aoife says, don't endanger the child, you know, don't do that. And there's multiple scenes where it talks about the size of the fetus at that point when it's being endangered. Um, and it was just such pro-life messaging um, that it really stood out to me. So I really felt like this story had some messaging that was very much, um, very much not the kind of messaging that I want to see. Uh, but it was also hidden. I don't think that necessarily people reading it are going to read it and think of that as uh, anti-feminist messaging. I think that they'll see the more surface level pacifism and, you know, kind of a world of women and think that it's 
got good messaging. And this is what I've seen when I've gone and searched online. I haven't been able to find anybody who sees it as anything but that. So it's possible that I'm just misinterpreting it. And I think that Harrow is somebody who can write a compelling story. Her writing is very beautiful. Her world building is really interesting. I know people really enjoy reading her works, but for me, it was just, I, I really could not get behind the messaging. And I think kind of to add on to what you mentioned, which is uh, this notion of feminazi as a portrayal, as a stereotyping, as a extreme version, so to speak, the real damage is in casting feminists as feminazis. And when you give a story that does do that casting, it can then damage the overall messaging. And I found that to be majorly uh, 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 an issue over here. Uh, the other thing that I kind of want to talk about is a notion of storytelling mm -hmm. and having certain devices in storytelling. When you use, say, gender swapping as a device in storytelling, it usually has a purpose. And typically in other stories, this, these purposes can be one, to try and uh, get you to consider a what if. And basically from that, see that, oh, the reality that we live in is very sexist. Okay. or and therefore uh, uplifting in that sense okay or uh, gender swapping can basically champion things and so for example with the ghostbusters reboot for example i think that this notion of imagining women in roles which were traditionally completely cast as men is championing them and i think that's a good thing in this case it was like the device was applied for what i mean i don't know that the story really changes if you had all of the um, so-called masculine uh, people be men instead of women, uh, would the story have changed overall? I don't think so. I mean, uh, at least not in a positive way. And so they think that is what really, really gets to me. It's like, what is the point of this kind of a thing? And it's very much a distinction between show and tell for me, where the telling seems to be uh, it's like we are for this and that sort of a thing and the showing seems to be at complete odds and when I started the story I was like okay this is going to be a pacifist take but it's not it's just a passive aggressive uh, take on the pacifist side and it's not like it uplifts or champions them or anything so I w it was just disappointing and I think that this idea of what did swapping those gender roles do? And it's not swapping the roles, it's just eliminating men. But what did it do to put women in that kind of uh, stereotypically male position? And I think that the message that I got out of it was, well, this is why women should only be caregivers. Because if you let them, they would just become these evil monsters who go to war. And that's what I had a really big issue with. So, yeah. So I also asked myself that question and the answer that I came out with was kind of one that I didn't like so much. But again, I could be really biased. I've had issues with Harold's work in the past and I haven't heard anybody else having issues with the story, so it could just be us. Um, but yeah, so I'd be very interested in what anybody else thinks. I ended up giving this one out of five stars, which is actually the lowest rating I've ever given anything that I've finished. Um, since I started keeping track of my ratings four years ago. Uh, so this was very much not my favorite story. Next up, we have Blood is Another Word for Hunger by River Solomon. And I think the premise of the story is a really interesting one. Uh, while there are many uh, tales that are moral tales of revenge and liberation, um, this begins with that and then explores what happens after. Um, and so it's kind of a really interesting framing in a sense. Um, so the primary character of the story uh, is a, a slave who sets herself free by basically uh, killing her master's family and basically uh, uh, and finds herself free essentially, right? Um, and then uh, what winds up happening is there are some magical elements in the story where she winds up magically giving birth to a new person uh, who had previously died for every person that she has killed in cold blood, so to speak, okay? And so it, while the premise is definitely out there, 
Um, I think what is interesting is in the what happens after, which is where the story dwells. In terms of themes, uh, I think it's really interesting because it's trying to deal with um, the non-satisfaction of resolutions. Things that you think should bring catharsis but don't. Mm. Okay, things that you think should change everything but don't. Mm. And then in yet other ways, it also is about things that you think shouldn't change much but then change everything. Okay, uh, seeing happiness in others and wanting and not being able to connect and that being, uh, what do you say, uh, oppressing in and of itself. Okay, so there's like a bunch of these themes that wind up being uh, kind of explored. Um, but ultimately, I think for me, there was a lot I felt like I didn't get there. I, feel, I felt like uh, this is a work of, for me, literary fiction, which I do not have the tools to really analyze very much of. I kept feeling like there was a, I was at the cusp of something deeper that I just simply wasn't getting. Um, and it's sort of like, um, it, it, it made me sit with some topics of like things like change and happiness and resolution, but I didn't know what to make of it past just the sitting with it in a sense. And maybe that is the point, but you know, it, it didn't feel uh, satisfying for me. I was left wanting more and, um, and, and I think that's kind of where I come down about the story. Yeah, I, I also kept hoping that there would be something else, um, especially the relationship between the slave who freed herself and these people that she has birthed is very unsatisfactory for me. Sometimes I just, I wanted there to be a different kind of relationship. Um, I wasn't really pleased with how um, there wasn't a feeling of liberation that I wanted for this character and how it still felt she was sometimes uh, at the mercy of other people. Um, so and that I think was that was frustrating. part of the point, yeah. but then I didn't get a, okay, so we're here, now what? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was raw. And maybe again, that is the point, but it's... Yeah, yeah exactly. So it could just be um, that we're not able to go on that journey far enough. Uh, but I think also I really struggled with the graphic nature of the story. This is really kind of graphic. There's a lot of almost body horror. There's a lot of trigger warnings in this and it's just, it's, it's really violent in a way that's hard for me to handle and that always is uh, problematic for me when reading stories is, is if there's a lot of violence and it has to do a lot to compensate for that and I just didn't feel like this kind of gave me what I was looking for in terms of the story to, to make up for all of that violence. So I gave this three and a half out of five stars. I think that it has um, really good, interesting themes and explorations of ideas, but I just couldn't um, get over the violence and I didn't understand enough of the message, I think, to, to get enough out of it. Next is 10 excerpts from an annotated bibliography on the cannibal women of Ratnabar Island by Nabedita Sen. So this is a really interesting um, collection of almost these mini essays in an anthropological style where there are people talking about this culture of women cannibals from this island where Westerners came and they tried to civilize them. They tried to take some of them away, um, bring some of them to the West and adopt them into their culture. And so you have all of these essays, some of these older anthropological works and some of these newer ones as you follow it through time, um, looking from both the colonizers perspective and the descendants of the Ratnabari women, their perspectives on kind of what has happened. So I thought this was a really cool premise and the themes that it explored were also really interesting. So definitely it, it explores the idea of colonization and of civilizing um, different cultures. So you have these colonizers who came in and they 
took women away from this culture um, and brought them to the West where they could not fit in and where they were separated from their heritage. And you have in these essays some of the colonizers talking about how uncivilized the Ratnabari are and how good it was to bring them to orphanages and things like this. And then you have essays later on from the descendants who are talking about being separated from the culture but also being unable to go back because it has been such a separation that they would no longer fit in there either. So it's a really interesting discussion of kind of the impact of colonization. There's also an interesting discussion of the role of women because this culture of cannibal women is a female dominated one. And so you have these kind of Westerners saying, oh, this is so um, uncivilized that they have women in charge of everything and this is going against all natural order of law and patriarchy. Um, but you also have this celebration from the descendants point of view of the strength of these women and of their power. So I really liked that. And lastly, you had just kind of this discussion of hunger. And again, it contrasts the hunger of the colonists to enforce their power, to take control, and the hunger of the Ratnabari women themselves in both a literal and figurative sense. So I really liked this exploration of their hunger for power, of the roles that the women play, and of how colonization can be viewed from different perspectives. So I really, really enjoyed all of those themes. I thought that the way that it was presented was really interesting in these mini essays, but it definitely kept you at a distance. Um, it was very much in the style of an anthrop um, anthropological uh, study. And so it reminds me a little bit of some of Ursula K. Le Guin's short stories that are looking at a culture examining that in a sci-fi setting. So I thought it was really interesting, but wasn't maybe as gripping as something that would be told about a specific person or following a more linear storytelling. And I think uh, there are a couple of things that I liked about this. Uh, one, I liked that basically there was an element of Indian fantasy mythos that was brought into this. And um, I think there's a lot in Indian fantasy mythos that doesn't frequently get explored because of its really, really close ties to what has become religious mythos. And so I like seeing that in a non-religious setting in a sense. Um, the second aspect that I think was interesting about this was it was uh, experimenting with format. Uh, last year we had, I think, uh, the, there was a short story called Stet that was trying to do something interesting where it was trying to experiment, experiment with footnotes and hyperlinking and things like that that I thought was neat, even if the story itself didn't work for me, but experimenting with format is always neat to see and I see a little bit of that here. Uh, I think also there was a short story by, I don't know if it was a short story or a novel by P.J. Lee Clark last year, um, and which was also trying to take like yes. 10 excerpts and kind of evolving the story through the thing. Um, this is much, this is somewhere in between uh, the two as I saw it, where I found Stead to be too abstract and uh, the P.J. Lee Clark thing really worked for me and it was much more of a story. It was something like the 10 Negro Teeth of George Washington, something like that. I'll link it below as yeah. well. And, uh, and this one kind of fit somewhere in between where it was trying to weave a story while still keeping an academic sounding lens in it. Um, it was very interesting. Yeah, it was definitely interesting. I, I enjoyed it, even if it wasn't my absolute favorite, I still really liked it. So I gave it four and a half out of five stars. Next up is As the Last I May Know by S.L. Wong. And this is a story where there is a country which has been the target of a very powerful weapon in the past. Um, the nature of this weapon is similar to our nuclear bombs in a sense and can level and destroy entire zones very easily. And this country uh, has that technology now as well. Um, and basically, given that they were the target of such uh, attack in the past, uh, they have try to evolve a system uh, wherein they do not take uh, the fact that they have this power lightly. Um, they have built around a system such that if they were ever to use such a weapon, then they would have to pay a cost. And the cost in this case is basically a little girl. 
and this is the story of that girl and and this is amid the city being under attack and then basically uh, constantly being on the brink of should we use the weapon should we not use the weapon so to speak okay and uh, in a sense for me this story really really uh, was the pacifist representation that I said I was missing in the previous Alexei Harrow short story. Uh, this is a pacifist story. The story centers the girl. It centers her desires and wants and her, uh, what do you say, uh, living with the uncertainty and uh, what do you say, still trying to look uh, figure out what is it that she wants and what does living life look like. Um, there are themes here which are really interesting. I mean, the pacifist theme is an obvious one, but also the notion of having allies that have agendas and uh, different kinds of allies with different agendas and how does that wind up look, uh, looking like. Uh, it also deals with life under uncertainty and what that can look like. Uh, I'm not going to go much more into this because I feel like there's a lot that is just simply something that you have to experience in the story. Uh, the theme is a simple one, but it's beautifully explored. And um, and as far as I'm concerned, I, I, this is my pick for the Hugos, uh, for the short story. Uh, it's a really beautifully done story, uh, which takes you into a theme and then explores it and lets you sit in it. Um, I'm, I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I also really enjoyed this story, even though it's not my top pick, I think it's an excellent story. I think one of the things I really liked about it was that it did such a good job of creating a story that really contrasted those who are in power and their decisions with this girl and her decisions and her power. Um, and I think that it really rejected some of the narratives of, you know, those with all of the violence being the ones in power. And to kind of uh, double down on what you just said, that's actually really important. It is the difference, it, it throws uh, the contrast between power and empowerment. Yeah. And that yeah. was really beautiful. Yeah, about this. so it's a very good story and I gave this five out of five stars. Next is A Catalog of Storms by Fran Wild. So this is a short story with a really interesting premise. It is a kind of a post-apocalyptic world where the world is sort of falling apart because there are storms. So the wind has become extreme, but also has sort of a malicious intent. It is attacking humanity and causing these great big storms that destroy towns and kill people. And in this kind of future dystopian world, some humans have developed the ability to fight back. They have developed the ability to recognize these storms, to name them, to identify what they're doing and to stop them in many ways to fight back. Um, these people are called weathermen. And we follow a girl whose aunt and now her sister have become weathermen, which is considered a great honor because it is a sacrifice that your family is making, um, but also it's something that provokes a lot of grief within her family because becoming a weatherman is something that actually destroys the person as they fight the storms. It, it takes them apart, it takes pieces of them, and so they um, are doing a great sacrifice by becoming weathermen. So this story was absolutely gorgeous. I really loved the writing in it and the themes were really beautiful as well. So one of the themes in this is this idea of a calling, a professional or moral calling, where the people who become weathermen, it's not that they train for it, it's not that they decide they're going to become weathermen, they just are, they are called to it, they find themselves being drawn to the storms, they find themselves naming the storms. There's all of this beautiful um, kind of aspects of how different weathermen name the storms that is part of this that's really fascinating. And they can't help but follow this calling and but do what they feel they must do. So that's a really beautiful part of it. But related is the theme of sacrifice. There's so much about sacrifice in here. The weathermen are sacrificing themselves to fight against this destructive force that is threatening their communities, but also the sacrifice of the families in losing valued members 
to this fight. Um, and related to that is also this big theme of kind of mother-daughter relationships and also sister relationships. Uh, the mother in this story is a really interesting figure because she is dealing with so much grief and anxiety and fear because she has lost her own sister and now one of her daughters. And she's trying so hard to hold on to them as they slip away. And I think that that was really beautiful um, as well as just sort of a metaphor for the way that mothers deal with their children growing up and leaving and sometimes getting into dangerous situations or things that they can't protect them from. So it was just a very beautiful story and I think that more so than even just the themes was the way that this book, the story, was so atmospheric. It was so beautiful and haunting and kind of um, you felt the storms and you felt that feeling of rain and gloom and fear and I thought that the writing was absolutely beautiful it was um, almost literary in feel I think that this is not a story that in the way a lot of SFF is is very like plot driven this one is not plot driven it's very much character driven and very much atmosphere driven and it's something that I actually had to read a couple of times before I was able to really figure out how I felt about it. So it's much more abstract, but it really, really worked for me. And kind of continuing on the notion of abstract, I had a read of the story, uh, which I think is something that makes, for me, the story really powerful, but at the same time, there is one thing that doesn't quite work in this abstraction, and that's what's holding me back from saying this is my pick, essentially. And that is this. Um, if you look at the weather and the uh, uh, kind of uh, the things that are attacking all the people as essentially a form of uh, the system uh, oppressing you, as systemic oppression, you need to be able to name and recognize certain aspects of what the system is doing to you in order to fight back. And in that sense, you need people who are able to see things for what they are to kind of call them out and basically give people tools and ways to avoid those things or to try and fight those things and kind of survive. You need people who are able to see through that and then basically fight that. And essentially, that's kind of where I saw this going. But then in this kind of view that I saw, uh, that ability to name things uh, basically makes you a fighter, but it also sacrifices you and disconnects you from the community that you are serving. And I think that's where I kind of have a problem with uh, trying to fit it in exactly, because yes, I recognize that in fighting, you wind up separating yourself from the community, but is it necessary? And that's where the analogy doesn't completely work, and at least for me. And so it's kind of one of these things where I'm trying to gel with an idea and I think there is a kernel of that idea and there is uh, interesting what ifs associated with it. Uh, but for me, it's not completing that. Yeah, and I don't know that I even really connected it to that um, kind of metaphor. I think for me, it was more just the emotions. The story. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. So maybe that's why it worked more for me. Yeah. But I gave this five out of five stars and I really loved it. And finally, we have And Now His Lordship is Laughing by Shiv Ramdas. This is a story set in the 1930s in Bengal. And I want to mention something right at the outset, which is that this story, when you read it, uh, and there'll be a link below, uh, has some of the more extensive content warnings I have seen in most stories. As in, it calls out what its content warnings are at yes. the beginning. And when I read that, I was a little bit apprehensive and I was like, oh no, what am I getting myself into? But I will say that the content warnings are appropriate and not out of place, okay? Uh, I think this is a good example of uh, being respectful and calling out content warnings ahead of time. Uh, but at the same time, none of it feels gratuitous for me. I felt like they were appropriate and none of it felt misused for shock value or anything like that. Um, so I'll mention that right off the bat. Uh, if you read the story, you'll see the content warnings up in front. Okay, 
So this is a story uh, kind of centered around this woman who is kind of a matriarch of her family. And uh, she has this skill with doll making, wherein she can imbue these dolls with a kind of magic. Now, it's not clear if this magic is something she has skill with or it comes to her and uses her. And that is generally something that you'll have to kind of follow the story about with. Uh, this woman's skill is noticed by the local uh, British governor and who kind of wants to engage her to make a doll for his wife. Now, um, and this is set in the 1930s in Bengal, which basically means that this is the backdrop of uh, Britain preparing for World War II. And essentially one of the things that Britain did at the time was it basically sucked up a lot of resources from various uh, places that they had dominion over and frequently in a very brutal and ruthless manner, including over here. So that's happening in the backdrop and things are getting worse over time and this request slash demand gets escalated and basically the story plays, uh, plays out the, what do you say, the consequences of that. Um, for me, in terms of theme, it's actually fairly straightforward. I mean, right off the bat, you have the uh, colonial themes, or rather, I should say, the anti-colonial themes. Um, and uh, in a sense, it's a very interesting part in history. Uh, I was aware of the atrocities that happened all across India at the time, but not specifically Bengal. I knew of atrocities that had happened in Bengal a hundred years prior to this. Um, the British were never exactly, you know, uh, uh, kind of on the best of terms with the local Indian populace. Um, and in a sense for me, this is a very classic moral uh, tale in the style of Poe. Uh, it has all the elements of a Poe story for me in that it is very rich and dark and uh, atmospheric, uh, lyrical and uh, utterly, utterly a moral tale. Um, so I absolutely enjoyed it. It is thoroughly engaging from start to finish. And basically, if you want that feeling of catharsis, um, basically in the moral tale, uh, this delivers. Yeah, and unsurprisingly, given my channel name, I really like this kind of story. I really love stories that are all about morality and justice and about um, revenge, that are about um, doing the thing that makes sure that justice is served, even if it's a little bit um, dark. And it's dark in that it recognizes that this is just a portion of justice. Yes. It, like... Yeah, that's very true. Like this understands that what's happening in the story is this grander scale of abuse of colonial power. Um, the backdrop of the 1930s in Bengal um, looked it up on Wikipedia and wow, um, the famines that happened because of what the British did were so intense and they killed millions of people. It was just and not just killed people, but left so many others destitute and starving. And it just destroyed the fabric of, of so much Bengali society. And, and I want to have one more thing yeah. really briefly over here, which is really kind of, uh, this is a reimagining of certain things that happened at the time. Uh, the primary antagonist of the story is actually a real character, uh, it turns out, from Wikipedia. He was the governor of Bengal at the time. So. And I think that one of the things that I liked so much about the story was that it was alternate history. It's a fantastical alternate history, but I really like the kind of um, the way that authors can play with retelling some sort of awful thing that happened in history and empowering those who were most oppressed. And so I feel like this story does that in a way that I really love. I also love that the main character is an older woman. I loved how kind of strong and not just strong in terms of, of power, but strong in terms of just internal um, decisions. She was really, really a strong character and had so much fortitude. She went through a ton and she just decided to do what she thought she needed to do. And I want to add a little thing here as well. 
uh, she is a woman of privilege in the Indian society in that kind of uh, era slash place. And, and in a sense, there is some play of that as well into this. I won't mention more for spoilers, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so I just, I love the fact that this is an alternate history. I love that it's switching the, um, the narrative uh, about these kind of colonial atrocities. I love that, that you have this older woman who is centered. I love that we're looking at Bengal, a place that has a very um, interesting history, but that I think we don't see enough of in SFF. So I loved all of these aspects and also just the mythology, the kind of um, magic system that is used in this is really fascinating. And again, there's kind of that dark moral tale that I really, really enjoyed. So this was just, it spoke so perfectly to me. It was five out of five stars and, and it was definitely my top choice for the Hugos this year. Okay, so that wraps up our discussion about the short stories for the Hugos this year. If you have read any of the short stories, you have any thoughts, you have a different ranking from us, or if you have read anything else by any of the authors of this that you would recommend, please leave us comments down below. We'd love to hear from you.